Hello everyone and welcome, welcome, welcome to the Media Education Lab. This is our third session in the Inequalities in Media Education webinar series and what a series it has been. We've had some rock star presenters and speakers and if you've missed those sessions, they're already up um, in on our website. I'm going to be adding links to the chat. And today we have the fantastic Dani Dr. Daniela Haranyo Dend. Uh, who's currently uh, working with uh, the media uh, section at uh, the University of Zurich, the Department of Communication and Media Studies. Uh, I'm going to be adding the link to today's session, as well as the links to her work, uh, which the session is based on, uh, to chat. And over to you, Daniela. Thank you very much, Davina, for the kind um, introduction and also for the invitation. I'm really excited to be here today. I have brought for you a presentation that is in a format that is a little bit different. So let me do this so you can see me. OK, and if you can see me at any time, please let me know. So today I'm really excited to be here today to talk to you about some part of my doctoral research and research that I carried out for the last four years. Uh, specifically on uh, TikTok and immigrants creating content on TikTok and specifically on immigrant influencers. So I will talk today about, first of all, the context of the research, how this research was developed. Um, I will talk about two of the studies. One is uh, related more to the platform and the communities of creators, of immigrant creators that exist in, in on TikTok. And then we will move on to the influencers and how they appropriate and take advantage of the different grammars, vernaculars of this platform in order to um, exercise their voice. So let's start with uh, my research, uh, a little bit of my research objectives and design. So I was interested back in 2018 in looking at discourse about immigration on social media. And I was interested in looking at the main actors talking about immigration. And I was very interested in finding about uh, out whether um, uh, the immigrants themselves were relevant and, um, and, and actors talking about immigration. I was interested in looking at platforms that were understudied at that time for this goal, specifically Instagram and TikTok later, because these platforms are more visual. And I was interested in looking at the ways in which these multimodal content, these multimodal elements were present on discourse about immigration. So my dissertation focused on different, uh, different studies, six different studies. And the first two, the first one was about the migrant caravans in the United States. So I looked at Latin American immigrants in both, in two countries, in the United States and in, in Spain. So the first one was about the migrant caravans on Instagram. The second one was about politicians in Spain using Instagram stories. And then I moved on to find the immigrant creators who were uh, talking about their own stories. And I looked at uh, migrants on TikTok first and second um, immigrant influencers, which is what we will focus on today. So one important thing before I move on is that one of the main reasons why immigrants don't create content online and why it's important to look at immigrants specifically is that they face many layers of oppression and discrimination in exercising their voice. And these layers have to do with legislation in both regions, in Europe and in the US, that actually enables governments to make decisions about documentation based on social media content. And this is something that we really need to consider when we look specifically at marginalized communities, but of course at immigrants. So I conducted a 24 month digital ethnography observing a community of Latin American immigrant TikTokers in the US and in Spain. And I identified these videos and TikTokers of interest within this community. So uh, for these two studies, one of them is about migrantes on TikTok and the other one about influencers. I took an approach that identified the relevant videos uh, among 53 Latin American immigrants in both countries. And I used a virtual snowball method for this. I used hashtags and keywords, which is enabled by the platform itself. But also I uh, wanted to identify with who were the most dominant and more influential voices within these communities. 
So for data collection, I used a, a Python script and I, I, I scraped it with a data scientist, a partner a, a researcher. And I also carried out interviews with some of the most vocal actors. Uh, in terms of the analysis, I did an inductive multimodal content analysis, qualitative content analysis, but I also, with the influencers, carried out a participatory content analysis, doing it with them to see what they meant to do. And I think it is important here to note this method that enables us to understand these digital contexts and how they change what can be done and how these creators connect. And this is the walkthrough method. So the walkthrough method is basically a method, an ethnography of the platform, where what we do is we navigate the platform and understand its affordances and its functionalities. And this is very relevant also in the media literacy field because it enables us to understand the difficulty and the skills required to create certain types of content within these platforms. So in my dissertation, you can see I do a proposal of walkthrough methods focused both as a user, so the functions that are available for users to interact with the content, but also the functions that are available to creators to see the, what they are doing and the skill levels that are required the skills are not only required uh, in terms of the technical aspects of creating the content, but also in the knowledge of the platform itself and the connective elements in where they act actually understand the visibility logics and regimes of the platform. So let's continue with TikTok's unique affordances. So I think it's important to note that through the walkthrough method, we can understand these specific aspects of the platform. So they has two, two different aspects that are relevant. On the one hand, the functions for reuse and resignification. And we have four examples of this. For instance, the stitch, which enables clipping and integrating parts of an existing video to a new video. The duet, which shows two videos that are next to each other and you can interact with that video asynchronously. The green screen, which enables you to embed a video or a photo beside, behind you or in your hand in different formats. And finally, the answer comment, where you can actually answer comments from your uh, viewers. And then the reuse and cataloging elements include the effect and the audio. And these two elements are elements that on TikTok you can click and connect to all the videos that have used this element before you. And this is unique to TikTok. And it is important to understand this because the creators also understand it. And you can really see how the community connects to each other through audio and through the effects. So now I will, I will delve into the first study, looking at this notion of platform belongings. So I, I theorize about this, uh, uh, defining it as these strategies of belonging that are deployed by migrants and other marginalized groups that instru instrumentalize these platform grammars that I just mentioned, these formats and these vernaculars to connect, self-identify, counter, or establish a dialogue with existing narratives. So in this case, they are able to connect and, and interact with dominant narratives, but also to connect with different layers of communities that they establish within the platform. So the study here analyzed two different aspects. On the one hand, I was interested in looking at these creative practices, this use of audio, the mimetic or imitation that they, that they uh, deploy within the platform and the visibility strategy. So specifically within the research on algorithmic visibility, what were the strategies that these creators were uh, establishing? And it is important to note that immigrants need to maintain in many cases as a, a, a level of visibility that enables them to avoid moderation or being eliminated by the platform, but at the same time be visible enough to maintain the content online for the communities that are interested. And then the themes within migrant, migrant communities were collective experiences, the migrant as a worker and empowerment of migrant communities. And now I will show you some examples. Now, in this format, I cannot, you cannot hear the music, but I will try to describe the audio because on TikTok, audio is important. But in this case, we see a video that visually is very similar. So all the creators are doing lip syncing with this song. And this song is a rap song created by a Spanish musician. And she creates songs specifically for TikTok. And the song is in Spanish, but what it says in English, the translation is that immigrants don't come to take your job away. They are doing jobs that you don't want. 
this myth must be nipped in the bud. While you're at home, they're lifting the country. You're sleeping, happy, receiving public aid while they're contributing in order to get you paid. So she's a Spanish uh, creator. And this is important because these beliefs about public aid are very Spanish based. So in Spain, there's a lot of public support for people who are unemployed. And there's this belief that immigrants take advantage of that. So this song was used by more than a thousand Latin American immigrants in both countries. So you can see that they really uh, identify. A thousand is not a lot for TikTok, but it is a lot for Latin American immigrants because it's a niche community. So here, what you can see, what we can see is that visually the videos are similar but they use elements that make them customized to each of the creators. And they are all pointing and lip syncing. So you can see the imitation aspect, but also the, how they make it unique for themselves. Now, Mimesis is very important on TikTok, specifically the, the functions of the platform enable and promote imitation. And this has been studied by Zuli and Zuli, and there are several articles on this. But of course, this is important in terms of education, because a lot of what we do as educators is based on imitation, but also for the promotion of culture and, and, for, and for, for group, cultural groups such as immigrants. So here I want to show you two, uh, two different uh, examples. One of them is this genre that on TikTok that I have called pointing and dancing, but if you have used TikTok at all, you're familiar with this. So you can see that, that uh, immigrant creators will uh, appropriate this format and instead and using music that is very fun they will talk about topics that are very serious specifically topics related to um, discrimination abuse the difficulty of being immigrants so they're providing a story that is painful within a, within a format that is playful and here you can see two examples both of them are using exactly the same song a very popular song used more than two billion times, I think, on TikTok. This is one of the most popular songs. And they are using the embedded text or the overlay text in order to customize the story. And this is used by a lot of marginalized groups using a genre that is very popular in order to tell stories that may be very painful, very controversial. And the second one is the use of mimesis in order to establish affinity within the community. So in this case, we see one creator, this is the duet format. So one creator is telling a story of difficulty and discrimination in Spain. In Spain, uh, in Latin American immigrants have a very difficult time working in qualified jobs. So in many cases, people who have a degree need to work in lower qualification jobs because of discrimination related to their qualifications, but also discrimination related to the colonial past within Spain and Latin America. So one of the creators is telling in her text that she has been um, discriminated. She's a cleaner, although she has studied journalism in her country. And the other creator creates a duet with her and she says a story that is similar. I have gone through this and now I have a qualified job. So you can see how creators establish affinity in their experiences, but also establish the idea of hope. And now the song that they use is a, is a culturally relevant genre, is a vallenato from Colombia. And the lyrics tell a story of how life's um, pathways are very difficult. So you can see how the music establishes also this soundtrack of the migrant experience and how they both understand the way in which this platform has, can establish affinity. But of course, we can see that this same uh, affordance of the duet can also be used to attack someone. So we can see that this is a twofold um, situation. Now, on TikTok, we have a lot of narrative templates or uh, genres. And we can see that immigrants have really understood, they really understand what these genres are. And these are very important in order to be caught on by the For You page or the algorithmic um, recommendation system. So here we see two examples, one from the United States and one from uh, Spain. So I'll describe them for you. The one in the United States is an immigrant who's using the green screen to show Donald Trump and his racist um, um, this course, and on the other hand, how immigrants are succeeding in, in the US. And he uses the green screen, but he acts as the two different actors. And this is a very common format on TikTok, the role-playing uh, format where the same person acts as two different people. In the second example in Spain, we see the immigrant using the overlay text to describe 
her being the immigrant and her being a Spaniard who doesn't like immigrants. So she provides this. Now, what is interesting is when you are scrolling through TikTok and you see this, this looks like a lot of other content on TikTok. So you may be caught on to, to look at it, but it is a very humorous type of content. So they're like making fun of their own pain. And this is a very unique way to, to be part of the platform and to establish their belonging to the platform through the use of the genres, but also to avoid moderation. And finally, the idea of the migrant as a worker. So previous literature tells us that, this, that the idea of a migrant who represents themselves as workers is a, is a, is a need to, um, to establish their deservingness to belong. But I would argue as an immigrant myself, that many immigrants, we just like to show ourselves working because we're proud of ourselves. So it, there's a twofold situation also. Now here, when we look at immigrants as, as workers, what we can see is that uh, they do establish their, their right to belong through productivity, but they also use different multimodal elements to show themselves as, as workers. So here you see the different visual work. You see that in the you, this really supports previous research on immigrants' work. Basically, they work uh, in the, both countries. Agricultural work is very relevant. And we see uh, there's a question here about women and it is true that a lot of the examples are about women, but there were a lot of men as well. And you see the influencers are mostly, no, I have two, I have the examples are two men and two women. So I, I try to be balanced, but not always, I guess. But the idea, a lot of the women who show themselves working show themselves in work that is traditionally for men, for instance, roofing. So we can see in the US that a lot of these women find themselves, they really become dignified through sharing the content of their strength in doing work that is traditionally male. So we see the intersectional aspects of their identity, their female uh, status, being an immigrant, and the way in which this trajectory of success and the American dream. But also in Spain, this idea that you start, the life is hard at the beginning, and later it becomes better. And now the music is very relevant. So for instance, in the, in, I think the next one, no. So here we see the music is very relevant because in the United States, we see a very long tradition of immigration from Mexico to the US. So we see that there are specific corridos, Mexican corridos, that actually have lyrics that describe these very specific narratives of success, of pain, etc. And, and we see that, that, that many of them use these corridos to tell their own stories. And then we see the multimodal elements within, um, within the work, right? So the idea of strength, of happiness, of gratefulness, and the idea of the two cultures and the way in which their identity becomes mixed between these two cultures. And also their use of hashtags shows how they understand the different levels and the different layers of visibility. Specifically, you can see that some of the hashtags are for mainstream visibility, such as for you or uh, this XBCA, which are the, some of these trends uh, to, to become viral. But other hashtags are very niche. For instance, they will use the area code of their country, or they will use you, uh, words like catracho, which is a specific word that Hondurans use for themselves. And no one else knows. I was Ecuadorian and I didn't know. So they try to connect at different levels of visibility. Uh, now, so that is about platform belongings. Now, when I looked at the influencers, the, some of the most influential voices, I was interested in looking at this idea of algorithmic invisibility. And these are the tactics by minority creators to negotiate this strategic visibility of their controversial content on social media. So I've carried out two studies on this, the first one on influencers, and the second one is more located at the specific tactics. But let's look at these three examples of influencers. So here we have an influencer that is very focused on the more of a cultural a promotion, a promotion of her culture through music, through, you can see it in the use of hashtags, the use of colors in the hearts that you see there. And she's from Honduras. She's a catracha and you can see her t-shirt says catracha. Now, uh, I'm going to tell you three different elements that she uses in her narratives. On the one hand, there's idea of multimodal identity from the dress 
to the visual colors, to the hashtags. She uses all these elements to connect herself to her community. On the second one, you can see how she uh, takes a stance in relation to different practices of creators. Here, she's talking about the ways in which some people in their countries will ask for money and then abuse immigrants and just ask them for money forever and not really uh, think that the life of a migrant is very hard and they're working very hard. And finally, this one is very interesting because what they do is they use this very pre uh, prevalent uh, genre on TikTok, which is a reaction video. So they take this existing video of people laughing and supporting her. And she puts this, this text that says, those of us who come as tourists, to stay. So you can see how something that can be seen as very controversial takes this very playful um, side. Now, this second influencer was to me very hard because I'm an, I'm, I am an immigrant myself and I had to really face my own biases because this influencer, she was, um, she was actually a, a right-leaning, anti-immigration, anti-pro-Trump immigrants. And uh, basically what we see here is that a lot of immigrants really follow politically. The political inclination is not going to be based on any expectations. They are just based on their experiences. And a lot of immigrants are just uh, more right-leaning. So in this case, she, uh, what was interesting to me is that she did a lot of, uh, did a lot of, for instance, this unwilling co-creation. So she would take content by other creators and respond to it uh, and, and, and respond to it in ways that were not maybe what the original creator intended. Like here, she's talking about the education of another influencer. And here you can see how influencers get into these ideological wars and how they try to establish themselves as the dominant voice for the community, in this case, the Latin American immigrant community. The second one you can see here, the, uh, the creation of these, what they're called in the literature is pods, influencer pods. So basically they're groups of influencers that have similar ideas and they help each other become visible. So she says, I'm a conservative Hispanic and I'm not alone. And then she shares, she does a stitch with all the different creators who are Hispanic and are uh, conservatives and are Hispanic. And finally, the idea of moderation. So here, what you can see uh, across the board, uh, the ideological board, uh, you have immigrants who are pro-immigration, supporting undocumented immigrants, etc., And you have immigrants who are more right-leaning and all of them are severely and heavily moderated. Their content is constantly being policed by the platform, but also by more social types of moderation where their content is constantly flagged, et cetera. And finally, we have, yes. So uh, yes, I will respond to this very soon. Uh, this question is very important. And then the last one is uh, this one. I think this one for me was very important, a very important creator. He is a TikToker, he's an activist. And in this case, we have somebody who uh, very aggressively faces um, um, ICE agents and he models behaviors that are constitutionally right to avoid abuse for immigrants by ICE agents. So as you know, in the US, in many cases, ICE agents engage in um, unfair and illegal behaviors um, in relation to immigrants. And what he did is he modeled the ways you can um, behave in order to avoid being abused. And he was very aggressive. And he, you can see here the hashtags he used, the, the emojis that he uses. And in my interview with him, uh, he was telling me that he has, uh, so he used to have a, a, a big account on Facebook and it was completely eliminated when they eliminate, when there was this big push to eliminate white supremacists in the United States, that's how he explained it. He says that his account also used words about um, white uh, supremacy and racism, etc., and it was eliminated uh, with those accounts. So when that happened to him, he wanted to maintain his following. So he would just he would he discussed it as playing the platform game or trying to become visible through creating content that was a little lighter. 
But later he just created the content he wanted, as you can see. But his account reached around 600,000 followers and then it was completely eliminated from TikTok and he had to start over. And this is not unique to him. This is very common among immigrants and also among activists on TikTok where their accounts are constantly being completely eliminated, blocked. And you can see they talk about it a lot online. But in his case, he just created a new account. And usually what they do is they have an account on Instagram and they keep some of their followers there and then they direct them to their new accounts on different platforms. Now, for the last creator, something that was very interested in, interesting in the interview is that he uh, his life had been in danger, like uh, uh, white supremacists in his region in, in, in California follow him around, they threaten his life. And he always said that he didn't, uh, creating this content was very important because he was literally saving the lives of other immigrants because a lot of immigrants don't know that they have rights and that he, he would rather die than not give this information. So you can see that creating content online for many of these creators is actually an act of courage and their lives are in danger, but this goal is more important to them. So we can see how this becomes really um, serious. Uh, so, okay, so now I have shown you all of the examples and I will give you some key takeaways, trying to think also about this idea of media literacy and how it's reflected here. So one important thing is that immigrant creators have many layers of culture that they need to connect to, specifically, their receiving countries that they're trying to become part of, but also their country of origin and also the communities within the country where they are. So immigrants become a community beyond their own countries, but also through the migratory experience. And within social media platforms, they also need to learn the languages of the different digital cultures that exist there. So here, what I have shown you is the, this idea of the genres, the visual genres, the imitation, the music, the use of effects, and the use of visibility strategies. So we can see that there is a high level of understanding of how the platform works and the ways in which they connect are very strategic to maintain different levels of communities. Um, and finally, uh, of course, the idea of controversial content. So content, today I didn't present the very controversial content, but they actually engage in very, very controversial uh, narratives. And the way in which they maintain it online is very interesting, but also we have to consider that a lot of the moderation, right now in, in Europe, we're having this new law, the Digital Services Act, where we can actually see how many moderators, human moderators there are. And uh, there are like more than 2,000 in English and there's 20 in Spanish. So you can imagine creating content in a minority language is also a form of resistance and a form of maintaining the, the content there. And finally, this idea of imitation audio and all those uh, reuse possibilities are very, very key in, in maintaining this content and an understanding of how they work. Something that is important is that the algorithms are constantly changing. So we're talking about learning that is happening constantly, continuously, and changing uh, all the time. So with that, yes, that is my contact. And I thank you very much. And I'm looking forward to discussing more. So, so there are some questions that I would like to, to talk about here. OK. So. Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was such a fantastic presentation. And I think people are going to be gathering their thoughts a little bit in a moment. Uh, this is your time to start thinking of questions that you want to ask uh, Dr. Haramio Dent. In the meantime, we already have a couple of questions in chat. Uh, Carmen wants to know, do you ever find backlash to your research work from people uh, from Spain and the U.S.? Uh, and as a follow-up, in doing the comparison between United States and Spain, uh, what was the finding that really surprised you? Um, okay, I would say that um, the backlash. So I haven't. So usually I am, I guess I am in a safe space. Usually I am positioned in panels, academic panels with uh decolonial scholars and scholars who usually support this work. 
So usually I haven't found a backlash, but of course I can imagine there is. It is also controversial work because um, a lot there is there are some there is related to the second question about permission. Uh, this is controversial, right? So let's talk about this because this is important. So uh, this idea of the ethical review board or, or the way in which uh, this works in the US and in Europe is very different. So in the US, the ethical review board works with, um, with a basis on uh, uh, having permission, right? To signing a permission slip. But uh, in Europe, how it works is you create a project and then you get an ethical review for the project. So within the project, my research had ethical review uh, approval. But uh, the issue is that when you ask someone for permission to use their content, this thing this uh, assumes that the, the person is the owner of the content. And because of the things I mentioned before, for instance, the idea that all the elements can be reused, including the visual, including the music, everything, it is very hard to establish ownership of a whole piece of content. Also, another uh, strategy that I didn't present today, but they, in many, many cases, they use audio. So for instance, they will record audio of abuse, let's say abuse of an employer, and they would share this audio on videos, on many videos. So the idea there is for the audio to be visible, but the idea is not for the audio, um, is not to know who is the owner, but it is to make visible the abuse, right? So in these cases, we see that the, that the paradigm of, of um, permission or, or what we call informed consent doesn't always apply to social media spaces and that we need to in, engage in more reflexive ways. But now uh, the influencers, I interviewed them, I did the analysis with them. So in that case, it was completely participatory. Another important thing is that the platform doesn't allow you to uh, connect with um, the, the creators themselves. It is very obscure. So when you message them, if they don't follow you back, they can see your messages. So I could only contact creators who had other accounts in other platforms or had any other types of contact information. So that would be the long answer to that. Um, now about the female yeah did you only focus on women yeah so no i focused there were men and i would say there were more men probably and in doing the comparison what finding really surprised you so something that is important is so i have actually expanded my research since i did this I, i'm working now with more latin american creators indigenous creators in latin america etc and Something that is very surprising is that the platform works very differently for different types of creators. So if you look at TikTok, you can really see that they um, that they really um, prioritize certain types of content. So recently we did an event and you could see a mainstream TikToker, 2 million followers, and he's the typical traditional TikToker who dances, who's doing fashion and he's doing these brands, uh, very mainstream. And he has the 2 million followers. And I had another influencer who was an activist, a human rights lawyer fighting for the environment in Colombia and the armed conflict. And his account has been eliminated four times. So we see that the platform really prioritizes play and joy, and it makes it very hard for political discourse to come through. And then we see this combination of the two. Now in Spain, it is very different. So it is important to note that monetization is not available everywhere. So creators in the US have the ability to make money from the platform, but creators in other regions of the world are not able to do that. So recently I was talking to this creator, he's an immigrant from Peru and he was he created his account in Peru and then moved to the US and he couldn't monetize because his account had been created in Peru. So he actually had to create a new account in the US in order to be able to be part of the creator's fund. So we can see that the governance of platforms are, is also different depending on your geographic location. And that is also something to consider. Uh, so there's another question here. 
Um, thank you for responding to Daniel's question about uh, permission and ethics, also expanding into ethics. Another question that Daniel has asked is, do you think it's about time immigrants began to create their own platforms, probably oh. to avoid being taken down, or maybe alternative social media that you could possibly be interested in? And we also have a question from Renee Hobbs, uh, who says, play and politics are skillfully merged on TikTok. Do influencers reflect on how they navigate the dialectic tensions between play and politics? What are their insights? Sure. So thank you for that question. That is, you know, that is exactly what we're looking at uh, right now. Uh, so what we see is that basically platforms have very established ideologies and values. And you, they're really reflected in the content that is constantly being moderated, silenced, or just made invisible. Uh, so what they describe is that this is not always, so the strategies that they can use not always work. So they just play with different strategies. So some interesting ones, one creator said that he would upload a video and the video would be eliminated and then he would put a filter like a filter that actually like rain or snow falling and this actually tricks the algorithm so he would describe specific things that they, he did but he mentioned that it not always works so the algorithm is constantly adapting to these strategies but you see that they're constantly playing with them so this was one and another one was to of course use just use hashtags that are popular and use hashtags that are related to their content. So for instance, he actually looked for hashtags that were popular that related specifically to what he was saying, although they were about something else. So he talked about a hashtag about a movie called Welcome to America. And he says, when this movie came out, this was amazing because I just used it. And because the movie was coming out, my content was also, but it was about America. So he actually made the effort to learn about this, this how this could relate to him. So also branding strategies from Victoria's Secret, he was telling me about uh, how he made plays on words to put his content within these hashtags and these, uh, and also the challenges, you know, the challenges on TikTok where you imitate what they do. Uh, and then when the content is very, very controversial, then you really see the strategies at play. But I think it's important also to, a lot of these strategies are secret. Like they actually share it in a way that is secret because they want to keep it, uh, to keep it working, right? So when we talk, the next question was about, um, yeah, their own platforms. Yeah, so I would say that, so I think, uh, Van Dyck really touches on this, right? And it's not about immigrants creating their own platforms, but different regions of the world creating their own platforms. So in her theory of platformization, I really love this theory because it shows two trees. She calls it the platformization trees. And one is the United States platformization tree and the other one is Europe. And she shows how platforms, American platforms are really um are really you could say colonizing but they are really occupying a lot of our human behaviors communication email storage everything while um in europe we only have specific platforms we don't really have the big five right we don't have amazon we don't have google we don't have uh, meta we have a specific platforms for specific functions for instance we have something similar to office so Platformization, the, the, the fact that only the US has these big platforms that are um, permeating all of our activities is a geopolitical situation where uh, they are having all the power because they are holding all of the data and the datafication, algorithmization, platformization. And now with AI is the same thing. Again, this is a US space. So Europe, so Van Dyck argues that Europe is at a disadvantage. But if Europe is at a disadvantage, imagine Latin America, Africa, right? So it's not only immigrants, it's just regions of the world. So Latin America needs platforms and Africa needs platforms. And we all need to start thinking of platforms that follow uh, also more uh, ancient knowledge of indigenous communities, of sharing, 
of maybe copyright is not a thing, you know, it's more about sharing culture and sharing knowledge. And I think uh, this is where my research is moving now towards this idea of uh, knowledge that it can be shared and that can be owned by the community rather than this idea of individual ownership. If I may drop a teaser and say, it's all about diversifying the digital commons. Yes. Um, <laughs> yes. Uh, I think the participants might also want to look at um, BKC Harvard's uh, rebooting social media uh, as um, as an alternative uh, to the current neoliberal uh, commoditized, monetized social media platforms that we have. Uh, so their idea is also similar to, well, maybe we need to have a different kind of social media. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. We have some um, praise coming in into our chat. Uh, yes. <laughs> yes. People are loving your presentation and uh, thanking you for answering their questions. Um, does anybody have any questions that they would like to um, ask live, you could come on video off mute and ask your questions. Or you could still use the chat and put your questions there and I'll read them out for our audience. Uh, in the meantime, ah, we have a question, sorry. <laughs> we have many questions. <laughs> is asking, is it more common for immigrant influencers to post activism style content or is it mainly following trending topics on TikTok like showing their work life and dances? Mm -hmm. So I think it is important to note that immigrants, so uh, something that is interesting is that I am an immigrant myself, right? So I was looking at this from inside the community, I think, and in many cases I became undocumented while I was doing this research. So I was actually experiencing some of the things that people were discussing when they discussed the political. But it is important to know that immigrants are people and they have interests and they're good at things, for instance, dancing, for instance, art, hobbies, sports, anything. And um, so because the way I was looking for the content was about immigration, my content really reflects, you know, there's this bias. Uh, the content is about immigration. But there was a lot of, 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 in the community, there were a lot of creators who had a lot of content about other things, about their business, about, um, about being lawyers, being dancers, being dentists, everything that you can imagine. Uh, because, but I would say that the closer they are to the date when they migrated, the closer this immigrant identity is. So they're talking more about this or when things in their life happen that reflect this. And then some people really use their, Another thing that has come to my mind more recently is that we always talk about marginalized communities while they are marginalized. So we talk about immigrants when they're undocumented. It is very trendy to study refugees, but we very seldom study immigrants when they have succeeded. So what do, do immigrants do with their privilege once they get it? And, and I have another study that I didn't discuss today, but I have a study where I look at the ways in which immigrants establish their agency, the way their, their narratives reflect their agency. And one of them is that some immigrants who have achieved some level of privilege, they actually police other immigrants and tell them how they should behave and actually become very discriminatory with their fellow community members, saying that they should adapt to the culture, for instance, of the United States or the culture of Spain. They should be grateful for what they're receiving. And you can imagine as a new immigrant how this would feel to be told how to behave or how to be good. Another form of policing that exists is this, um, is this, this uh, policing of how to be, for instance, an Ecuadorian. So if you're an Ecuadorian, you need to speak Spanish without the Spanish accent. So they would police uh, the, their culture. So you can see there are many levels of policing and, and but definitely migrants are at, in a range. And I actually have another study where I study migrants who engage in political debates because they actually get, uh, do videos, live debates where they talk about the political interests that they have. 
And this is interesting because you can see how migrants, many migrants are not political actors because they're not able to vote, but they have a strong political opinions and you can see this online. And this is interesting because this is something that is not really understood. Um, I would say that the question about the most challenging part, so for that, I, I would say, I, I would like to say a little bit about myself. I, I am an immigrant for 20 years, I've been an immigrant. And I was undocumented in the US and also in Spain. And, the, and, and when I defended my dissertation, somebody asked me, and I thought this is great because I'm in the community, I'm going to do work that is relevant. But the truth is that very few people can actually change their opinion. So the people who are very close to me, who I love very much are anti-immigration. And I do this work, the idea is that you would make visible these narratives. And the hardest thing is that you can't. So people that love you very much because they haven't gone through it, they're like, well, you're not an immigrant anymore. You're in Switzerland, right? They would say, and it's not true because when you're an immigrant, you're always an immigrant. And then other, so the hardest part was the personal experience of migration while doing it. And they asked me when I defended the dissertation, how did you take care of yourself? And the truth is I didn't know I should. So I, <laughs> it's like, I didn't know. So that was hard. And uh, then there's a question about, thank you for that question, uh, uh, Renee. I really appreciate it. I, I really love Dr. Hobbes. I really, she really got me hooked with the research. So I really, I, she's really special to me. And then uh, this question about Africa, I would love to, I have this really good friend in uh, uh, Equatorial Guinea. Uh, so I did my master's with her and I would love to do things in Africa. Uh, definitely. There's wonderful African creators. Oh, I love African creators. I've been following them. And so, yes, I would love to. And the, the immigrant influencers whose work you really admire. So, so I would say, um, I would say the one I showed you last, the one that goes to the border, he's really cool because he, he's great because first of all, he, he's, he does something nobody else does. He shows his face and he's an activist and he doesn't care. But also he becomes a voice for the community because a lot of immigrants who are going through this abuse, they can't create their own content. So what he does is he actually blurs their faces and he shares their content and he models the successful stories and the unsuccessful. So when people are deported because they let someone in their house, you know, in the States, there's all these, so he, he becomes the voice for a whole community of people being oppressed. And he was undocumented for 24 years. So he has a personal experience. Uh, so that is in that case. And then, we will take our last question for today. It's from Michael. Uh, mm -hmm. Have you included any migrants in movement traveling through Mexico to the US border in your studies? And you wonder, he's also wondering about any crossover to Anna Maria Niag's comment on about Facebook as the trip advisor of migrants. Mm. Also, that your work is brilliant and multi-layered and comprehensive. And it sounds <laughs> a book or maybe even a series. <laughs> Thank you. And I agree, it could be a very good series. Oh my God, I really appreciate it. Uh, so, yes. So I did this work. It is not in my dissertation because I did it while I was doing my dissertation. I did it with Paya Larora and uh, Mandalenka, two of my supervisors in the Netherlands. And we did this report for the UNHCR. And the report specifically is actually about um, pathways of literacy through digital leisure. So it is interesting because Entertainment is not seen as something marginalized communities need. It, we also we always try to tell them what they should do with the digital, especially, especially they should learn, they should work, they should make money, they should integrate. But we don't think that a lot of times refugees are in these spaces, in this situation for many years. And there are children born in refugee situations and they are living and entertainment is a human right, right? And digital entertainment, is proven to be a pathway for literacy that you cannot get through classes, right? So our report looks at the ways in which refugees want to use the internet. 
and uh, the ways in which they actually want to use it. So we looked at music, we looked at even taboo practices like porn. Uh, we looked at the ways in which they use their phones, how they share them and how they maintain privacy while sharing physical and digital spaces. And this is based also in the research by Paya Larora on the idea that digital products are designed for the majority in the world. And there's the next billion users, basically a lot of people in the world, in regions of the world for whom the digital is not designed. So we have this report. I can also, sh I share it with, I'll share it with Davina so you can see it. And it's called the digital leisure divide. And it is about how refugees, now, how is this related to Anna Maria Neak's uh, work on the trip advisor for migrants, right? In this work with the UNHCR, I have had a lot of year, two years I've been working with them. And we've been talking about TikTok as a, an uh, opportunity for boys, but also is, an, is also used for abuse, right? So traffickers use TikTok in order to reach these communities. And here we also see how these languages and vernaculars are instrumentalized to reach marginalized communities such as immigrants. And when immigrants are going up this Panama jungle, the very dangerous part, they use this to tell each other where they are, but they also use this to find and locate them. So it is a two, two-fold situation. And they and at UNHCR, they are actually uh, partnering with a lot of the influencers because one of the things that is maybe not so much so known uh, with mainstream users is that refugees had a very hard time trusting what we call credible information because credible information doesn't represent them accurately. They don't see themselves represented. So what is accurate for them and credible for them is not what is accurate for us. So they have their own networks of information. And there's a lot of influencers and creators who are part of that. So yes, I would say social media becomes a, a trip advisor, yeah, or, or, a, or a pathway to be followed by them. Um, and, and I would say uh, there's a lot to be studied uh, about, uh, I think that the, the intersection between media literacy and refugees and, and minority populations is very important because there are many skills that they have uh, much more developed than others, such as the skill of, of privacy, because they have been surveilled much more. And, and the way in which they handle that, we can learn a lot from. So yeah, so I think, uh, you know, there's a lot to do. And my work is just like at the tip of the iceberg, I think. I think your work is extremely fabulous and uh, it's a very good tip of the iceberg. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I've also added the link to the UNHCR report on the digital leisure divide in the first three displaced. I could find part two field research. It's in uh, the chat. Yeah. Um, and uh, of course, you mentioned uh, the rock star researcher that is Professor Payal Arora. Um, I'd like tell all the attendees that um, she uh, is co-founder of FemLab and our last session in the Inequalities in Media Education webinar series was Professor Payal Arora and Professor Usha Raman who co-founded FemLab uh, talking about their open access book. So I've added that link to, to chat as well. Um, I see we are coming up uh, at the end of our hour and I'm going to use the last two minutes to thank uh, Dr. Daniela Haramia Dent. This has been a fabulous, uh, brilliant presentation um, of equally brilliant, no, more brilliant work that you've been doing uh, all these years. And um, I think uh, I'm, I'm, I, I can't quite find the link, but you should check out on YouTube. Uh, she keynoted um, at, uh, at, at the conference, and I'm going to add that link if I find it in a bit. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, let me tell you, towards the end of this month, we are going to have um, a webinar on AI in K-12 as part of our webinar series on AI in the classroom. I'm just adding the link to chat for that here. And I'm also adding the link to the overall webinar series page where you'll find recordings of our previous session. This session is also being recorded and you'll find the link to that has already been shared in chat. 
and you can watch it or you can share it later with people who could not attend. Thank you everyone for attending. Thank you so much, Daniela. Thank you so much. It was really a pleasure. Thank you. And I'm going to just stop recording now.